<clears throat> this uh, webinar is using just to build a strong culture and engage workforce. And uh, like I said, we'll be co-teaming this with uh, Lisa. Uh, Lisa Bouchard is the owner of Data Dome Incorporated, an organizational development firm based in Rochester, New York. And she spent the last 23 years helping many organizations achieve their goals through engagement of their people. Lisa spent over 13 years in retail sales prior to starting her consulting business. She's a CPBA and has worked with the DISC assessments for over 20 years. And she and I both uh, do certification training programs and I'm sure uh, You've probably either been to her class or my class uh, since you've got involved with the uh, Charter course. She's also uh, the founding board member of Journeys of Solutions, a nonprofit that focuses on infrastructure improvements, healthcare, and the educational needs of third world countries. In her spare time, she's uh, very active, uh, enjoying traveling, kayaking, skiing, golfing, and hiking. And uh, if we have time, maybe she'll talk about some of her adventures <laughs> at the end of the, of the webinar today. Or anyway, um, so let's uh, roll on here. I, I guess we should put our pictures here. If you don't remember what we look at, there you go. I'm, I'm the one on the right. Lisa's the one on the left. So here's uh, what we're going to cover uh, today. So Lisa, I'm going to turn the baton over to you. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you get a lot of value out of this session that we have today. And uh, what we really wanted you to walk away with was a strategy. Um, and we're a couple of different areas that we're focusing on is if you haven't rolled this out in your organization, kind of a process and methodology to do that. Um, we're going to talk about different things that you can do when you're facilitating to kind of take that to the next level, different exercises and things that you can do um, in your facilitation. And one of the things we feel is really important is how you clarify your objective to ensure that when you're doing a session that you're going to hit the mark. And we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's some great exercises. And I think one of the other things that's really important um, is to make sure that the training sticks. So we're going to talk about some things that you can do after the training that would be educational or application or add on to that. So what we've done is sort of broke uh, this work uh, webinar into four uh, sections. And as Lisa was saying, uh, many organizations, many clients we work with, they don't have a strategy when they implement this. They uh, sort of just treat it like a you know, simple workshop, flash in the pan, move on, do something else next year. And uh, a lot of them have come to us saying, well, how do we make this sticky? So what we want to cover first is, um, you know, what we do in advance uh, of conducting a workshop. And uh, so what, let me get all these bullets up here. And Lisa, feel free if you want to jump in on any of these. But the first thing you have to have is have a strategy. Uh, a lot of people get excited about DISC and they say, oh, we need to have a workshop. And, and then it's over and done with. So what you need to do is develop a strategy, how you're going to implement DISC, who's going to do what and when. And the second thing is make sure you get buy-in from the leadership team. I got a call recently from a, a training uh, person in the company and the president of the company is all excited about implementing DISC. And, and then, uh, you know, she really takes off on another trip and it never quite gets off the ground and everybody's sort of skeptical. So if you don't, you have to get some sort of buy-in from the top uh, before you get going. And, you know, the next slide, I have a, you know, a, a diagram on how to set this up, but uh, you, you need to put a steering team in place to is sort of like the, the steer the direction on uh, where you're going with DISC and have one person, a key leader in charge responsible for it. it, it, it HR, the training department should not be responsible for implementing DISC. They may do the yeoman's share of the work, but you need to have someone on the, the leadership team in charge and become the face for 
uh, initiating DISC. And then again, clarify objectives and outcomes. You know, what do you want to do? When do you want to do it? And stick to it and have it down in writing somewhere where you can go back and make sure it's all being followed. And then it may be necessary in order to build trust and get buy-in is, is have an offsite just with the leadership team on how you're going to do this. And let me just sort of just put this, this diagram up here. Not only does this apply to implementing DISC, but it could also work in almost any type of implementation model, whether it's the old days when we used to do TQM uh, to uh, you know, what we're doing today. So the advisory team is uh, you know, your consultant, whether it's an internal or external consultant, you know, HR, and you know who the leader is going to be to become the face of the of disc and uh, the steering team you can probably get away with just either having a steering team or advisory team but depending how large your organization you may need both but um, you know having some sort of you know guidance team set up to ensure that everything is implemented throughout the organization so it's not just a disc workshop it becomes it needs to become part of the culture it needs to become part of the training plan it needs to become part of the development plan and uh, inculcated with just about every process in the organization the key thing i, I want to emphasize is many uh, many plans, many implementations die on the vine because you don't involve middle management. Middle management, you know, or whatever's left of middle management nowadays, sometimes feels like uh, it gets dumped on them. They don't get buy-in from them, and therefore they're going to kill whatever it is um, you try to implement unless you involve them from the beginning. You know, uh, I always like to pick one leader. In the organization who's highly respected from all the workforce, whether you know it could be a union or non-union, and make sure that person is on the advisory team. So if this uh, uh, individual who's respected on the front line is part of this process, you're going to get a better buy-in than if you, you don't have someone like that. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on and let uh, Lisa take it uh, on this slide. Yeah, and just to add to what Greg said, you know, um, having that process to get all the buy-in and making sure that all the piece parts fit in the strategy, um, I think it's becoming so important that when we're delivering soft skills training that they actually see hard results from them. So a lot of times when you have the steering committee and the advisory board, you know, to really clarify what are we trying to accomplish in the organization? Are we trying to reduce turnover, increase employee engagement? up our customer satisfaction scores, build trust, like what are we trying to do? And again, I think that really helps with the strategy because people don't just see it as a soft skills training, they see it as something that's really producing significant results in the organization is gonna help them. So one of the things we always wanna do before we do a training is clarify the goals and objectives of a session. And a lot of times, um, we have people that are just like, well, they just want to learn about DISC, but we always really want to make sure they're crystal clear. Most organizations don't give us a lot of time to do the training. You know, they might only have two or three hours or four hours. So you want to make sure that that time that you have really hits the mark for what that leader is looking to accomplish in the training. So a couple of things, whenever you see red in this presentation, that's actually a resource that we're going to give you. So we do this one page disc overview. You can actually, you print it on two sides and one side really explains, you know, the strengths and the limits of each of the DIS and C and the other side really talks about how to communicate with them. And it's done on a wheel graphic, which is a great way if somebody doesn't know anything about disc to quickly um, explain it to them. The other thing we have is a client intake form. I'm hearing feedback. Are you guys hearing feedback as well? No, nope. you're not. Okay. Okay. Let so me, another thing that we utilize is a, is, a, is a client intake form. And what this is, is it's a form to really have a robust conversation with the leader 
And when you do that, you can find out about the team dynamics, what's important for them to walk away with, what issues or challenges are they currently experiencing. So that when you facilitate, you're really facilitating with the knowledge and understanding of the group or the team in where they need to change or develop or grow. The other thing the client intake form has, we have an electronic version and a handwritten version, um, is um, simple logistics for the session. I love this because I'm a high eye and sometimes I forget to ask all the details about where it is and how to get there and how far it is from the hotel and what's the room set up and who's printing the materials. So it also includes all of those things as well. So we just find that when you take the time to sit down with the leader and go through this, it just makes for a session where the exercises that you choose match what you're trying to accomplish with them. And it, it really makes you hit the mark when you do the training and they walk away with what they intended to get. Anything you wanted to add to that, Craig? Yeah, just a couple of things, Lisa, appreciate it. And uh, I know a couple of people do hear some feedback. I don't know how bad it is, but I'll try to minimize it if I can. The um, you know, you have to, if, if you're the person who's responsible for implementing DISC along with uh, the senior leader, um, you know, you, you sort of just pretend you are a consultant, you know, and sitting down with the, 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 the leadership team, the president, whoever, and go over that client intake form with them to find out what are, uh, you know, what are the drop deads that you need to make sure happens. Uh, everybody has different expectations. And, you know, number one, you have to make your, your disc workshop fun as well as educational. Uh, but uh, everybody has different expectations on what you're supposed to be doing, whether it's improving communication, improving team building, improving um, the motivation of the team or whatever it is, make sure you understand what those expectations are. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, this bullet here, discuss current issues and challenges, make sure you understand from your leadership team what might be going on uh, that may affect uh, the disc in the future. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the things I wanted to add, Lisa. Right. So, um, you know, and this one uh, sort of is a reflection back on, uh, you know, one of our clients who uh, had a, 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 a president who was excited, super excited about implementing DISC, but, you know, didn't have a very good, uh, I should would say, credibility with the rest of the company. But... Uh, and so the training person's job was try to build trust with the leadership team. And what we suggested is, you know, have the leadership team go through a, a mini session, have them take the assessments uh, or cover an aspect of the assessment to um, let them know that this is something that really has powerful impact on the, on the workforce. Um, and I said is you don't want to leave the managers out. And that's always the biggest complaint when we work with companies is that management is left out. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what a disc report is. They don't know how to debrief a person, uh, a direct report that works for them. And that's one thing you need to teach them as part of your strategy, your action plan is, you know, how to interpret the disc report and debrief uh, the individuals on his or her team. Um, the other thing we did to help get uh, celerity uh, behind our implementation is um, had a, you know, the president introduce every workshop. You know, this, this organization, they had about a, 100 employees, you know, about 10 different departments. And so uh, we had an offsite, just the leadership team. And then the, the, the president took on the, 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 became the face of DISC and introduced uh, me who was doing the training and talked a little about DISC, which made everybody uh, from each of the departments feel like the, he really knew what was going on and not just a, an absentee figurehead. So 
let's talk about the the next slide, Lisa, uh, about um, you know actually putting on a workshop. Yeah, so um, that was all pre-work, and then you're actually going to do your facilitation. So, you know, again, once you've done that client intake form, it really gives you the clear objectives that you're going to base the session on. And I always say when you do a session, when I think sessions are really effective, um, I think they always include what I call heart, head, and hands. And heart is the people sitting in the room know why they're there and they know what they're going to get out of the session before you even start. So we usually do a couple of exercises and discuss like the opportunities of what they're going to get out of the session. We've actually started to um, add in session goals, like what are the goals for you or for you with your team or you with your customers. So it gets people to have a little bit more invested in the session. So in um, head is, I understand why I'm here and I understand the information that you're giving me and how you facilitate just the methodology of this. And then hand is how am I going to use or apply what I have learned to make a difference, to make a change. And uh, I think if you're ever missing any one of the three, it's not as effective a session. And then there's some team building exercises and we have a slide on this with a bunch of different exercises that we'll, we'll show you as well. Uh, and then I think the other thing is, you know, sharing best practices, you know, what worked well, what didn't work, um, what, what are some things that we could do different. And we're also going to show you a slide about individual and team information. Uh, we really find that when people see each other's graphs, you know, whether it's on a table tent or it's on a, you know, a badge that they have, or they have a group graph with everybody on a wheel or on a graph it really makes the uh, information come alive because they're not looking just from what their style is, they're looking at, at the other people's style. And, and back to what Greg said, you got to make it fun. I think people learn so much better in a fun learning environment where people are laughing and having a good time when they're applying this. So the next slide talks about the uh, group displays in the wheels. And with these, um, do you want to talk about those, Greg? No, go ahead. Okay. So the, um, you know, inside of the IDF system, if you do a team report, which if you haven't done one yet, they're fabulous reports. Um, people just love the information. It's where they combine all the individual reports into a team report. It's just chock full of great information. But if you do a team report, then what becomes available is you can print um, name tents, like table tents, or you can print like the picture here with their, their disc and their driving forces, you know, on a badge that they can wear. So it's nice that, you know, they can see that and other people in the room can see that. And then the other thing that's displayed here is a wheel. You know, you can put a big picture of the wheel up. You can give people, you know, red, yellow, green, and blue dots, and they can put where their dot is on the wheel with their initials on it. So you can actually see an overview of the team. But it's really nice to have visual displays. I think it really kind of locks things in for people when they can see those. Yeah, what, what I always found doing workshops is everybody wants to know what each other's color is. And uh, we, in addition to these name badges and name tents, uh, uh, we uh, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, we oh, yeah, we use these disc dots, these red, yellow, blue, green, uh, Avery dots we get at uh, Staples or Amazon and everybody wears their color. I know this sort of breaks the rules about putting everybody in a box, but everybody just tends to like to see what each other's color is. And then as Lisa was saying, I used the big flip chart wheel and everybody just post it with, with, a, with a, one of their dots and where they fall in the report. And if you're a good facilitator, you, you will be able to uh, sort of just understand the culture of the company by just doing this big flip chart. You'll see where the gaps are. You'll see how many D's there are, how many I's there are or, or what, and uh, do a, you know, you know, just a 10, 15 minute session just on this one, one little exercise. So we're talking about different exercises. I, for sake of time, I'm not going to cover all these. Uh, it, hopefully, you've gotten one of my 
two icebreaker books, which has all the details on this, but I'll, I'll cover uh, uh, one or two of them for sake of time. Uh, the first one I like to do sort of in the beginning of the workshop is you always want to break the ice. You want people to feel comfortable with each other. If, they're not, if they don't feel comfortable with each other on their team, they're not really totally participating. And I put everybody uh, at, a, at a round table. I have them pick their own team captain and everybody will become a team captain during uh, the workshop. So nobody can get lazy and not really participate because, you know, they're going to get picked by one of their peers and they're going to be in charge. So what is one exercise that's called the team chart. And we have flip chart paper in the room and um, uh, they have five things they have to do. And it, depending how much time depends how well they know each other. If this is a group of people that don't know each other well, then it's going to take longer. If this is a group of people they work with, it's not going to take as much time. So here's the five things. They have to come up with a team name, a team logo, a team motto, a team song, and list the name of each individual on the team and the one strength that they bring to that team. And that can be uh, taken off page five of their disc report, or they can just, you know, uh, just, you know, tell everybody out loud. And they put that on a flip chart. And at the end of the time period, everybody shows their team chart. Now, depending how much time you want to give them, I've had them get up there and dance and I've had them sing their song and they have, you know, really just go wild depending how much control you give them. But it's a, a great way to break the ice and for everybody get to know each other on their team so that they can really uh, go deeper in the process as you're going through your workshop. The other one, the other ones is um, um, alphabet bingo. And sometimes I do that at the end of the workshop and it's a uh, you can put everybody in one big team, you know, 10 people or more. Or you can have two groups of people, two teams of people. They have to pick a recorder and then they have to find one item in the classroom for every letter of the alphabet. So A would be apple if they found an apple. Apple. So they have to make sure they have it. It's visible. It's on a table and it's written down with the recorder. And the first team that comes up with something for every letter of the alphabet wins. Um, so it helps to have people who have pocketbooks because there's a lot of interesting things in pocketbooks that go with the alphabet. And uh, like I said, the first, uh, first team that gets all the items wins. So those are a couple of icebreakers you can use or team building exercises. Most of the time, our clients say, not only do we want to learn about DISC, but we want to do team building. Uh, and then again, if you have not done a thorough job, uh, you know, uh, talking to the meeting planner prior to the workshop, um, you know, you're going to be in trouble because usually if you're working with inside of a company, there are all these skeletons that they don't tell you about until they come out in a workshop and you don't want that to happen. So um, let's go to the next slide on some of the best practices. Right. Yeah, so one of the things that we see to be thoughtful about is how are you gonna seat people, you know, and with, with small to medium sized groups, you know, it's nice if you can do a U shape or a conference uh, set up so that everybody can see each other. You know, if you're working with larger teams, it's nice to do uh, round tables that are, you know, half round so people can see the presentation at the front of the room. You know, we always want to make sure that the room's set up correctly. Sometimes you walk in and it's done classroom style and it just isn't as conducive to learning with each other. Um, the other thing we always want to make sure we're doing is sharing some of the report information. So as you go through and debrief the report, you can have people share different pieces of it. You know, the general characteristics, you could have everybody share, you know, here's um, one strength that I bring, here's one thing that might be challenging to others. You can have them share how they do and they don't like to be communicated with and their value to the organization. So it's good to share. And then uh, Greg talked about the disc doc. 
um, and how you can utilize those. And a couple other things that we're going to give you is resources, um, is uh, the relating with each behavioral style. It's a communication worksheet that, that's a nice resource for this. And then another one that we'll give you is called Team Dynamics. Um, this is one of my favorite exercises. I, I do it with almost every team that I work with. And what you do is you break the group up by primary style. You know, what's the highest point on their graph, DIS or C. And then each of them has a flip chart. And we have them divide the flip chart into six sections. And then for each of the group, they fill out uh, one section is this is the value that we bring. Another is here's some things that might be challenging about our style. One is here's some things we might do that frustrate others. Here's some things that others do that frustrate us. Here's how we do and don't like to be communicated with. And here's why we need the other three styles. And then the groups share back with the large groups and have a discussion about that. So we've included that exercise in the facilitation uh, notes for it. And then you know, everybody hates uh, role plays, but Sometimes to do relevant role plays are really great if you talk to the group beforehand about what would make a difference, what are they struggling with the most, and you can do some role plays around that. A lot of times when we do the role plays, we do, um, here's a typical role play when I don't understand this, and here's a adjusted role play. Now that I understand this and I'm a D and they're an F, I now know that I need to slow down and take time and give them time to think. Um, so it's nice sometimes to do the role play so people can people can see what you would typically do and what you would do in an adjust jump view. Yeah, the uh, you were saying something a minute ago, Lisa. It just sparked this uh, nightmare in my mind. Um, <laughs> both 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 Lisa and I are you know we've been doing this for over twenty years, and. Um, so we we both will coordinate with the meeting planner or the leadership team to come in and do a workshop or or some sort of implementation. And so I don't know. I, I think, Lisa, you like me, I have this checklist that I send to the meeting planner and what I want to have in the classroom when I show up. And then I usually you know go over it prior to showing up. Try to make it easy on the meeting planner and or the hotel or wherever the meeting is and you know says need a projector need a screen i need this you know i need that here's how i want it set up and um i, I was good was in austin texas recently and sent it out to the meeting planner and always show up an hour hour and a half early to make sure everything is because part of implementing disk is is showing that you're a professional to the people you're working with. And if you're not prepared when everybody walks into the classroom or you're just getting set up, that's to me a sign of not being a real professional. So I show up an hour early and it's in this antique 1800 schoolhouse <laughs> next to the police station uh, outside of Austin. And so nobody's there. And I always ask someone to be there when I show up. Front door's locked. Well, I found the back door was open. So I, you know, I get everything out of the rental car, go through the back door and, you know, looking like I'm, a, you know, breaking into this place, which is right next to the police station and get in there. Nothing's set up. All the tables and chairs are still sitting in the corner. There's no projector. There's no nothing. And so they all show up like five minutes before the class starts. So in that case, I had no control over uh, <laughs> having my part of the job done. So um, let's look at, we talked about the actually delivery of the workshop, the, the facilitation part. And then we're gonna talk about what do you do after the workshop? Because it's not over once you do your workshop. That's really just the beginning of the whole process if, you process if you're trying to make DISC part of the culture. So, um, Lisa, you have anything you want to add or do you want me to take this one? Yeah, yeah. I can start with that. No, I think one of the things that's important is doing evaluation um, for a couple of reasons. You want to see how you're doing so you can improve. Um, and I think a big part is, to me, it's always an excuse to go back and have a meeting with the leader. 
so we can debrief how people, you know, what they got out of the session, and it's a great place to talk about next steps. So we're going to give you uh, an evaluation that we use that you can customize, you know, and change to use use yourself as well. We're going to give you that. I recently just did one on Survey Monkey. You know, what we found is um, a lot of times we get, you know, 30 evaluations. And if you have to hand do them, it takes a long time. So we went on SurveyMonkey and did one. My concern is always after the session, they don't want to fill out the SurveyMonkey. So if they're sitting in the session, they have to hand it to you. It's different. But what we did find out is you can actually have them do it on their mobile phone in the session on SurveyMonkey, and then it, it calculates everything for you. So we've really, uh, really liked that new approach that we're going to take. Um, the other thing, post-workshop, and again, this is that excuse to meet with the leaders, what, what are the next steps? You know, are we going to have people get together to talk more about it? Are we going to maybe now do workplace motivators or emotional intelligence? Um, you know, how can we make sure that we're keeping this alive? Um, we've got some slides to talk about how to incorporate it into processes and keeping it vis visible and on um, the communication guide. So we can go through some of those. Yeah, the, the other thing about making it uh, sticky is uh, a couple of other organizations. Uh, I worked for Delta Airlines years and years ago. And Delta used to wear their disc score on their name badges. <laughs> they don't do that now, but they used to do that. And then uh, another organization uh, put everybody's disc graph outside their cubicle door. So uh, when they um, uh, were going into their office or they were going to talk to them, they would see, well, how do I speak to a high D or a high I or a low I? And uh, so that helped um, make it stick a little bit more. We have these we weekly email disc tips that you can sign up for that, you know, sends you a little reminder tip that says, you know, what is a D drive or, you know, how, do, how does an I dress or what type of restaurants does a high C like? Just little easy to read tips to, to keep keep it going and another military organization and you know they had the, the photographs of the chain of command outside in the hallway and someone said well why don't we put their their disc dot color on their photograph <laughs> yeah that uh, I don't think that lasted long that was sort of outside the envelope for the for the military and um and then your leadership team, they should, every time they give a presentation, somehow they need to put in some sort of disc language or send an email out. Uh, otherwise, like I said, it's just going to die on the vine. So uh, both Lisa and I have these little dip, uh, tip cards you can order. Uh, everybody likes those because it's just like a little cheat sheet they can put next to their monitor that gives you the characteristics of the four styles. But really people, I think what Lisa said early is people are gonna judge the effectiveness of DISC based on individual's behavior. Uh, does a manager improve his leadership ability because uh, of the training? Uh, does team building improve because now they're following some of the processes they picked up during the, during the workshop? So let's uh, go to the, the next one. I think we uh, may have already done that one, didn't we? Yeah, I think we talked a bit about the evaluations, and uh, we have a little bit more to later about next steps to kind of make it sticky. Yeah, and this is about how the different processes uh, you incorporate DISC with. Yeah, I think the one thing we find um, is if you can kind of fit disc into all the other things you do in the company, it starts to become a little bit more part of the culture. You know, it's not just the training I went to. We now use this to hire people and get the right people on board. And then once we have the right people on board, they go through an orientation process that includes disc and they learn about disc and they meet with their manager and they share profiles back and forth. 
you know, when they're doing succession planning and we're looking to, you know, move people in the organization, DISC is included as a part of that, you know, performance evaluations, especially if companies are utilizing DISC is, you know, always looking for a place where people can develop and improve and putting that into the performance evaluations and having people be working on that during the year. Um, definitely in leadership and team training that we use it in sales and customer service. But I find the more that you can incorporate it into some of the internal, especially HR processes, the more it becomes part of the culture and part of the language that they use. Um, so it's not something that just comes and goes. It's actually, you know, so grounded in so many of the other processes. I don't know if you wanted to add something to that, Greg. Yeah, I was, I had one of, one of my uh, students tell me you know, she was put in charge as, at speaking at the employee, new employee orientation um, and to talk about DISC. And, um, you know, that's a very important opportunity to let everybody know what the organization stands for and how they communicate. Uh, but, yeah, you need to in incorporate DISC and you can incorporate DISC in almost every type of you know, training program you have, whether it's leadership or customer service, is also uh, uh, assessments that, uh, that uh, you know, there's assessment for customer service and there's one for leadership, there's one for executive level. So there's a type of assessment that, co you know, coordinates with, with these processes that we're, we're talking about. And um, so, you know, that, uh, is is very important. Uh, I was doing another webinar on how to use uh, assessments and in, in identifying and hiring salespeople at the end of the month. So you know you might look for more information on on that as well. So uh, uh, let me just talk a little bit about this, Lisa, and you you can jump in on on this anytime you want. Is uh, we talked already about keeping it visible, you know, putting your disc graphs on your cubicle door, your name badges or whatever. Uh, we have one client that uses uh, armbands with the, with the four colors. And uh, there's a, a new product that just came out at a, at a conference, Lisa and I attended uh, the, with the Rubik's Cube. So uh, it's like a little team building exercise you do with the Rubik's Cube. And, you know, so there, you may see more information uh, on that down the road as well. And then we also talk about the name badges. If you run the team behavior report, then you're able to print off personalized name badges and name tents. And um, this is what one client it used. I don't know if you can really read it, but before I talk about it, I just want to make sure you know where to find the handouts. I probably should have put that uh, link in the front of the presentation instead of the end of the presentation. But the website page you go to is chartcourse.com slash handouts, all small letters. That's chartcourse.com slash handouts. And you will get an email uh, I think today or tomorrow that will also give you that link to download the handouts as well as those other uh, freebies that we've been talking about. There's a really a lot of valuable tools that we're giving you today. So this client, what they did is take everybody's assessment and uh, take out little snippets of information on how to communicate with the individual employees the how not to communicate to them and the ideal environment if they could choose it where they would like to work so uh, there's all sorts of ways to take information from the individual assessment to make it an ongoing process throughout the you know the lifetime of of your of your existence with that particular organization so uh anything you want to add to keeping it visible lisa that we yeah, I think those those are all good, good, good things. You know, a lot of people, sometimes people, what they do too is they take the um, the name tents that have the profiles on them and put them on their desk is another good idea as well. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of people that take those disc dots and stick them on their forehead too, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then I think that, you know, the big part, you know, before the workshop, so important to really make sure you got strategy and you're going to hit the goal. And then after the workshop, like so important these days that we're doing additional things to make sure that the session has made a difference. Um, one of the things that we've added to a lot of our presentations is homework, you know, that there's things they're doing. Um, often it'll be something about their own personal, personal or professional development. It might be about communication on the team and doing a further exercise, you know, for homework with one or two people you're challenged with. But, you know, having some type of a homework and a follow on to offer to people, I think really helps make it sticky. Another thing that I've really been doing a lot um, is talking to the manager up front about if they want to hold people accountable to development after the session. You know, I think everybody walks away from the session and they see that there's some things about their style that might be challenging to others. You know, they're too aggressive. They might be too negative. They might, you know, be too slow. They might be, you know, way too detail oriented. And if there's something they're going to work on, I think it's great to have accountability discussions with the manager about adapting those behaviors. And it, it's really nice um, if that's built in up front that people go to the training knowing um, we have a feed forward exercise where they pick the one thing that they're going to be working on and then they get feedback from other people about how to work on that and often we'll use that as a place where they can talk to their manager about I'm really working on this. I think it would make a huge difference for me and the team um, in my results and that they're supporting them. I think the other thing is what other trainings are you doing to expand the knowledge or the application of what you've done. You know, I mean, DISC, you can do an additional training where you actually talk more about the low DIS and C. Um, you know, you can take it to the, the expanding it with different exercises that you might not have had time to do in the training, but it kind of keeps it alive. Uh, one of the things we often have people do after training is one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, where they actually sit down one-on-one -on -one with other people in the group and really talk about how to build those partnerships, you know sharing where they think each other brings value, where they might be challenged, how they do and don't like to be communicated with, what they're going to do different, go forward together. And then I think also, um, I think it's really nice for people to get together uh, and share best practices and challenges. Like, boy, I've been doing this and it's worked really well and other people can learn from that. And also talking about here's some things I'm still really challenged by and getting ideas um, from other people as well. But those are just all ideas of things you can do after the session that um, kind of reinforced everything that you've been doing. Do you have anything to add to that, Greg? So, um, no, I think that was, was pretty good. I want to give you a question, though, to think about, and then I'm going to come back to you after uh, after we talk about the handout materials but one of our um, attendees has a question on what type of assessments disc assessments do we use wiley or something else <laughs> and uh, you know what do we recommend so i know you could probably do a whole webinar just on what you think about uh, the other assessments out there but uh, i'll come back to you maybe give a, a few things about uh, the assessments, I can tell you, we don't use Wiley, we use TTI, but we're going to come back to that because we, we have a little time at the end uh, to um, uh, talk about this. So let's talk about the materials that are available to you. I have the link at the bottom of this slide. Uh, should have had that uh, up front. Uh, so you can go there, get the handouts as well as these other materials. Um, so, do we want to say anything about uh, any any of these, Lisa? Yeah, no, I think they're just good resources for you to have, and you know, a lot of them are in editable format. So, if you want to change anything, you can. You know, the client intake form and the evaluations. You know, you can you can do things to change those to make them you know fit fit what you're doing. Yeah, they're um, the one relating with each behavioral style is a. Uh, a handout I put up there that, you know, 
talks about how do you communicate uh, with each of the four styles and uh, there are other materials as well as other uh, material and copies of other webinars I've done in the past on that particular page. And like I said, you will get an email with, uh, uh, you know, with, with that link again, in case you lose it when we hang up today. So you, let's talk about uh, what type of assessments we use, Lisa. Yeah, um, you know, I'm always looking at new assessments on the market and some of the older assessments. And um, I've been loyal to TTI for about 24 years. I really don't feel there's a better assessment on the market and for a couple of reasons. Um, one is I think they're the most comprehensive and accurate reports. Um, a lot of the assessments will break you into one of 16 styles and you get one of 16 possible reports. And that actually only fits about 59% of the population. So there's, you know, a good part of the population that kind of fits in there, but they don't. With TTI, um, it's one of a possible 384 different combination reports based on your style. So I think that's why people find them to be more accurate. I think people also like that there only takes about 10 to 15 minutes to fill it out because a lot of the assessments on the market take about 45 minutes. Um, and what I like the most about the TTI products are every page is something you can apply and use and it's all specific to you. There's one page about communication tips in there, but everything else is very specific to the person that filled it out. Where many of the profiles on the market, there might be a couple pages about you and everything else is just disk information, um, which you could give anybody in a handout. It doesn't have to be in a report, so you're only paying for a couple of uh, you know, pages about you, and these are completely about you. Um, a lot of the new reports, um, what they're doing is they're, they don't talk about the low DIS and Cs, which is just as important as the highs. Um, they only talk about the high DIS and C. Many of the reports on the market only show, you know, the circle with the dot or one graph. And why I like TTI reports is they have a natural and an adapted graph. And the adapted is how you're changing in the work environment in order to be successful. And to me, when we're doing development, that's all we're focusing on is people making a choice about how they're adapting their style to be successful. <coughs> Excuse me. So it doesn't pigeonhole you into being one style. It's people being aware <coughs> that they can change or adapt. So that's why we stick with the TTI profiles. I just feel they're the most comprehensive um, and, and most customized on the market right now. Yeah, the, the other thing that just uh, recently TTI was selected as the top 20 out of 5,000 assessment companies. And just like Lisa, uh, I I can re, I could sleep peacefully knowing that these assessments are the most accurate out there. They're updated every two years. Um, uh, it's not just some kind of Mickey Mouse assessment that you find off the internet. And you can find free assessments, and you can find uh, expensive assessments, and then you can find assessments that are less expensive, but it's buyers beware. I just know uh, I'm gonna use TTIs and I'm not gonna worry about uh, other companies. And being selected as a top 20 out of 5,000 assessment companies, you know, pretty much speaks for itself. Um, the other questions is, um, is the PowerPoint going to be available uh, on your website? Yeah, the PDF version of the, of the, these slides is on on the website and um, and you know so we got a, another minute see if there's any other questions um, Lisa this is another question maybe going to you says can you go back before the end of the session to explain the heart I got the head and hand part but not the heart okay. also explain oh, sure, sure. Yeah, the heart is the people in the room are sitting there knowing what's in it for them. And, and we usually start, you know, the session with something that really gets people grounded in what they're going to get out of the session. And mm -hmm. head is understanding the knowledge and hands is application of the knowledge. A lot of times we get into 
teaching them about DISC and applying it, but they still, you know, they, they might even leave the whole session not seeing the opportunity of how this is going to help them. Mm -hmm. We always like to start with that. Yeah. And another question is, uh, how do we use the assessment uh, after you have a new hire? Uh, I know we use uh, assessments for um, for hiring or uh, as well. And I guess the next slide, that's sort of my cue, is um, DISC assessments can be used as part of the hiring process, but we recommend that you use not only DISC, but a more advanced assessment as well. And uh, you know our company as well as leases provide you know advanced level assessments that uh, borderline on uh, a clinical assessment, but you know stays in the realm of work related questions. Um, so so yeah, we have clients that use us just to uh, do the assessments and then tell them you know, A, B, C, or D or uh, on uh, on the applicant. So if you want information on that, just, you know, contact either Lisa or myself. Uh, on the, the new employee, uh, we recommend not, not only is this report just good for a workshop, but it's a great tool for, uh, you know, having that important conversation between the employee and his or her first line manager. That's why it's important to train the managers how to debrief the report and, uh, you know, uh, have discussion on the best way to manage, motivate, and communicate to that, to that individual. You don't just run the assessment and stick it in the drawer and never look at it again. It, it has to be part of, you know, as we've been saying over and over again, part of every process in your, in your company. It's a very, at least our reports are very valuable, very powerful if you know how to debrief the individual with all that customized information that, that appears on the, on the pages of that report. So um, we're getting close to the end. Says, do you have a PowerPoint on how to go from beginning to the end when you conduct uh, the training? I'm not sure if I understand understand that but maybe you're asking do i have a a workshop outline on how to run a workshop and and if yeah okay uh so yes i do uh teresa I, we uh, i'm sure lisa has one too but if you email either one of us i'll be glad to send you uh the outline and if and if you're one of my certification students you should be be able to find that on the members only website as well all right any anything else we need to cover lisa no i think that that was good all right um uh, we'll just end with uh our appreciation for staying on the call the entire time um i have been using disc for uh, a long long time and uh, I feel if you master DISC, you don't need to jump back and forth between Myers-Briggs and Strength Finders and all those other assessments. Um, uh, and uh, all that does is just seem to confuse people out there. But anyway, we appreciate you being on the call today, and uh, I hope you have a great afternoon. As well. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care. Bye.